First off, very exciting. I'm really interested to see what is going to come of this. Uh, it's Francisca Listov Saboya and Randy Pope talking about the grinding work that they've been doing. And um, it's a, uh, the name of the speech is pretty exciting. Oh. NBC SEAE Gold Cup Grinding Research. Yeah. Uh, okay. The aim is to reveal whether the grinder, uh, whether it be flat, conical, or burr size, any, any changes to the, to the burr set, if that has any effect on the taste of the coffee. What do you guys think? It might. We will find out. Uh, for instance, can we enhance certain flavors uh, of the coffee depending on which grinder we use, so on and so forth? So, Francisca is going to start... Actually, Randy's going to start, but I'm going to talk about Francisca first. She has a master's degree in sensory science uh, and has been in the food industry for 10 years. Um, her focus is on taste and sensory characteristics of things. She has worked in consumer research, training judges for sensory panels. Um, she w has worked on things from fish to akavit uh, in the Danish industry. Um, industrial sector. Yeah, and currently she is the head of the NBC and SCAE Gold Cup Research Project. So she has brought Randy Pope from Bunn uh, with her. He has been at Bunn for 35 years. Uh, Randy knows his brewing stuff. Um, he is the director of Bunn Beverage Technology, uh, the center there, making uh, uh, research and development programs for them. And um, yeah. Well, he's also co-developed uh, Coffee Basics 101, which outlines the basic brewing terminology, uh, fundamental elements of proper brewing, and water to solids ratios. So, um, are you two ready? Yeah. You guys want to get your grind on? <laughs> Randy, uh, you're up first, right, Randy? Okay, great. So, big round Randy of applause. Pope. Well, thank you. Uh, to kind of cover what, what we're looking at, grind sets, uh, burrs, that uh, really we need a set of definitions and, and descriptions of what, what we're really talking about. When we talk about grinding, uh, from an engineering perspective, uh, the term comminution of simply breaking the cell structure of a whole coffee bean down into smaller and smaller pieces. And a lot of discussion goes on about grind size. And I much prefer it be called grind size distribution. Because no matter how you go back and you grab yourself a bean and try to break it up, you will have a multitude of sizes within that distribution. Because they will not fracture individually into perfect sizes. And looking at how we grind coffee as a rule, is gap grinding. Virtually every grinder we use is a set of burrs, uh, either flat facing each other or conical with the male, the female part to uh, set the gap in that, or whether it's roller mills in a commercial application, and we'll take a look at some of those. But generally we're talking about the gap between the burrs and how we go from the breaking process of breaking down the whole bean into smaller pieces and then passing them through the gap to end up with what we're looking for. Basic reason behind grinding is that if we tried to soak whole bean, it would take an enormous amount of time by the time we got through the cell structure. Uh, so we simply provide more surface area by breaking that bean up. A lot of variables influence how we grind and the grind distribution we get. Blends of origins, uh, blends of varietals, single origin, all have different effects on, on how we uh, end up with a grind distribution, whether the bean is particularly hard or pliable and plastic-like. So depending on origin, hard bean versus something that's more soft and tenacious will actually grind different. Probably one of the key factors is degree of roast or roast color. Uh, roast color comes down to whether we use the Agtron system of something light like a 65, something near the middle of a 50 uh, to dark over in the 30 uh, plus range. Degree of roast, 
Uh, I often describe it to some of my classes of it's kind of like lumber. From a kiln-dried piece of lumber we would build something with to a charcoal briquette. That if we whack the piece of dried lumber, we may get a few large splinters. If we hit that charcoal briquette, we have a lot more fines distribution. So the darker it gets, the more brittle it becomes, and the more difficult it is to control fines. Because as it breaks up into smaller pieces, naturally you have a, a wider, if you will, distribution. And then how we quench the coffee uh, at the end of the roasting process can certainly have an effect. Uh, whether it's a water quench, where the cool water hits the coffee, and in most of the information I've read, uh, it actually, it's kind of like taking a hot piece of glass that isn't tempered and hitting it with cold water and it shatters. And it kind of does that to the cell structure of coffee uh, if they quench it with water more than so if they cool it with air as it comes out of the roaster. So the quenching process can make a difference in how that coffee is going to grind and the distribution. And then, of course, the gap setting uh, between those cutting surfaces is where we start seeing differences. So oftentimes we ask ourselves, how do we uh, get these coffees ground up? So here's a couple different uh, pictures of a conical set. Normally in a set of burr type grinders like this, one is always stationary, one is rotating. Uh, generally in the conical, the male part is generally the rotating surface of the cutting surfaces, and they are generally fed by gravity down through the burrs. Rarely are they fed by an auger, but they are simply fed by gravity. Therefore, the size of the bean has a little bit of difference in flow by how quickly it breaks up and flows through the burrs. Flat burrs on the other side generally are either in the horizontal or the vertical plane, uh, and they are oftentimes either rarely fed by gravity, but sometimes fed by an auger to pull the coffee in between the burrs. And in between those two flat burrs is actually a gap that first you can kind of see uh, you have a pre-breaking area to break the bean into smaller pieces, and then it passes through the various lengths of the cutting surfaces of the burrs, the final gap being out on the outer edge. In commercial rollers, these are actually pictures of ones from a large commercial uh, roller grinder where the entire surface is splines of cutting edges. They are actually rifled like the riflings in a, in, a, in a gun to roll them around and they both rotate in opposite directions of each other. Generally there's a pre-breaking set above uh, and sometimes even a closer set below to put the put the profile on the grind that they're looking for. Much more precision, much more control. Of course, not something we'd have sitting on the, on the shelf in the store. But it gives us an idea of the different types of, of grind sets. There are grinders that actually look like interlocked teeth that I didn't include in this because it's more of a crushing system rather than a cutting shearing uh, action on the bean. Also, when we talk about grinders, if we back up, here we're always, basically talking gap grinding, uh, there is impact grinding. Impact grinding is what you may see from a blade grinder uh, with the blades up in the bottom of the coffee container. And it's more of breaking it on impact. The issue behind impact grinding, even if you go back to a pestle and mortar, is that you have a very difficult time controlling uh, grind size or a final size because you have no gap control. How do we measure this stuff? How do we know what we ended up with in our grind distribution? This is a picture of one way to take a set of sieves and basically in the sieves is a set pattern of screen wire. Now when we talk about the different ones, when we get into the uh, data later, uh, here we have a 16 to 20 and a 30, and that is the lower three screens. Generally, there is a, a 12 on the top of the 16, but in the set I set, sent over, basically we're working from about 1180 microns down to 850, and below 600 would be what we would consider fines 
or the fines section uh, when we get into filter coffee. When we're talking espresso, a lot of times, uh, you're talking screen wires and micron ratings that are down in the 300, 250 range. Uh, you can see that the Rotap doesn't, or the sieve style, doesn't work as well with espresso because it tends to, as it's bouncing around, uh, collect and not flow through the screens. So sieve analysis works well when you're in the upper grind range, something in filter coffee or coarser. And one of the names of, and the name of the particular product I use is a Rotap, not to, not to promote anybody, but it's simply a good description of what it does. It takes the load of coffee you put in the sieves, and as it's oscillating or rotating, it's got an arm on the top uh, with a large cork tapping on the top. So it rotates and taps. And generally, it's about a five-minute cycle to bring that grind distribution down to the screens, and then we measure what's on each one. And it gives us a profile of how many fines, how many mediums, how many large, are in that distribution. Some are done by air, some are done simply by vibration. Uh, this one happens to be a Rotap. Laser diffraction analysis is more in the line of what people are using today in the roasteries uh, to see a curve of what that looks like in the grind distribution. And basically it's blowing the coffee across the laser and it's looking at the sizes and the particles and you get a much broader picture of everything that's in the grind distribution, and it works much better when we're talking something extremely fine uh, down into the espresso range. Here's a typical uh, shot of a laser with the bimodal uh, range in it that and again, I'm not an espresso expert. I will never hopefully say that I am. Uh, but from what I've read, what I've tried to learn is you have two phases within espresso of the finer segment uh, creating the quick extraction and then the, the larger segment or bimodal having two sets of kind of grind distribution in there to control and time to, to let it flow through in a reasonable time and time and extraction walk hand in hand. That with that very fine distribution, uh, one being a physical, one being a chemical, to get everything in there, uh, that when we're talking our sieves here, we mentioned 12, a 16, a 20, and a 30, and you can see by this distribution, 83% uh, of the coffee is still below a 600 in the espresso section. Normally, when we're looking at uh, filter drip in the U.S., it's only about 20% uh, to 25% below the 30. And in this case, it's, it's 80 plus uh, below that curve. But you can see all the different distribution uh, down through what would be a very ne relatively narrow peak, but a lot of more information than we ever get when we're talking about uh, coffee from a regular batch grinder, if you will, for, for uh, drip brew. I use three different grinders uh, for these distributions. And here we broke out the normal sets that we use with the 1700, the 1180, the 850, 600 micron, and then what we catch in the pan. And when we do a, a graph on those, you can see there's very little over in here with the three different ones, eight being finer than 10 on this particular grinder. You can see in the pan there's 32%, 26, and 22, and that's simply by rotating the setting major tick marks, if you will, on the grinder. And one of the things I found is it, there's not a lot of movement between the burrs. When we take big swings at a grinder and move it from simply 8 to 10, we only move that 0 .004 inches to change that. It's not a huge movement between that gap. It's amazing what, you'll never play limbo with coffee grinds because the big ones somehow slip through that skinny little gap. 
So you end up with this distribution, but you can see in the, in the eight over here in the finer coffee, only 0.05% uh, ended up on that screen, about 3.5% on this screen, and about 25, 38, and about 32%. Grind distribution for a fine grind, at least in the States, and I know it's a little di different here for what is considered filter grind, uh, would be 30% plus or minus, or I should say minus 5 plus 10. So as much as 40% in the pan would be a normal distribution for a fine grind coffee for filter. Normally a 20 plus or minus 4 for a drip grind. So you can see simply in the sweet spot of that grinder from 8 to 10 uh, would get you simply from a drip grind to a fine grind. Now, ideally, the least you amount leave here and look for about 30 and 70 here, but this one was down to, like I say, about 3.5%. So if there's plus 10 here or minus 5, some's going to graduate back. But this gives you an idea that there can be a huge change just in a very minor change of a grinder. This one is more along the lines of a drip grind, or I believe a fine grind, let's see here, at the 30 to 600. Uh, this one ended up with, if I can track that across, 34. So again, 34% uh, is in the pan or below 600, which would still be in that fine grind range and you can see it has a little longer curve and a little wider distribution. And the, the correlation of the first graph with the, with the row tap with the four basic screens looks nothing like this. It's, and they really don't directly relate. It's whichever one you use, understand, uh, that's the one I would say you, know, you go with. Uh, I've lived with the sieve analysis for so long, it, I'm more comfortable with it. This is kind of a visual, I don't know that anybody's ever presented it this way, but all the graphs and all that kind of stuff didn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but if you look at it as, you know, what would be 0 0.05 over here versus, you know, 32 and a half down there, these are kind of simulations of the little grind mounds that would be on each one of those screens in a sieve analysis. So it may be a little more helpful to see where those ranges and valleys change throughout that ground, grind sieve, is what ends up in the number 20 sieve, what ends up on the 30 sieve, and what ends up in the pan. So we can kind of see how that works uh, through the grind system there. This is another uh, grinder that we used and again the ranges of uh, setting 5 to setting 7 to setting 9 you can see 9 here uh, put 25 percent in the pan and it is actually closer to what I would call the drip range but you can see up in the 1180 uh, it has a considerable amount uh, that ended up on the 1180 screen and then 42%, that is a nice fine grind at the 7. So 0 0.05, 2.65, 15, 42% of the pan's living on the edge, but just a minor touch on that would bring it off of the, back into the 40 range. Yet we went two more ticks on this particular grinder and ended up with 75% of that grind sample in the pan. Again, when you're looking at a grinder and you see the, either the wheel on the side or the knob, Minor changes make big differences. So chunking from 7 on a setting to 8 or to 9, there can be a wide distribution depending upon the uh, type of grinder that you're looking at. Just another idea of the curve. Uh, this 30, 32% uh, being in the pan the idea of what it actually sees from the laser, it really surprises me that there would be 4% in that coarse pan. Uh, I don't actually believe that result from the laser uh, if it's only 32% down there. But depending on how it saw that particle go by and what it judged it for size, uh, again, why I kind of stick back 
Whether it's fuzzier or more accurate, I don't know. Again, the distribution of the grinder we saw on the curve uh, from zero here down to 75% of that grind uh, at setting five on this particular grinder. Just a different view uh, of how that coffee is across those distribution ranges. This one happened to be the first conical uh, that I did. And with it, again, uh, you can see what their tick marks were uh, at setting 14, setting 16. And you can see this one, of course, climbed. Uh, as the number went down, it went finer. But you can see how tight, really, the range is between broader steps for that particular grinder. So even though there were tick marks in between, we went from basically about a 21% grind to a 25 to a 32. Really nice, smooth steps with a lot of, of range in between uh, to be able to see what we end up with with a particular grind distribution. Again, those little mountains of, of coffee as they as they change through the distribution to kind of just get a different perspective of what's in those screens. From zero, when we set a set of burrs in a grinder, normally what we're doing to set that grinder initially is to find zero, where the burrs actually come in contact. And from that point, burr wine, whatever we want to refer to it as, touch off is zero, meaning the burrs are together. And with some burrs, you still don't have complete closure because the cutting edge is that if you looked at the edge, kind of looks like a sawtooth. So actually you're hitting the high points. So you will get some coffee through even though you've just made contact with the burrs. Others are secondary mill operations. Uh, might be referred to as a Turkish burr, where they go out and they mill the edge off of the saw teeth right at the edge of the burr, so you get an even closer gap uh, in setting your grinder for your initial off point, and then how far that backs off with each turn that you make uh, in that grinder. But basically, uh, this one happens to be a bun grinder because of access to it, and we normally have a dial on there of 0 uh, through 15 or 0 through 16 uh, divisions on the screw for the grinder. But the first hash mark is only 0 .0023 inches open. The sweet range, again, that we saw in those early graphs at 8 to 10, uh, the actual gap measured between the, the high points of the burrs 0, 0.185 to 0.2. So about 231 uh, ten thousandths of an inch, 0.02, uh, 20 thousandths here to create that gap. Just for all of the Europeans, this is something like three millimeters. Thank you. I knew someone yeah. would do a conversion for me out there. So it's small changes. It's very small changes uh, to get rather large differences in the gap. Just another look at what, what does the grind distribution look like and what are the effects when we simply go from 8 to 9 to 10. Uh, we can see here on the 1700 micron screen uh, 0.03 to 0.05 to 13. Now, this was with a different set of burrs than what the earlier sheet was. It was a set of what we call the Turkish burrs with the outer rim ground off, so they actually start off closer. And you can see the distributions here are smaller than what they were in the earlier screens. And the thing I found amazing is really these two sets of screens, that here we're at 30, we're at 25, we're at 19, and here we're at 29, 32, 35, is they actually reverse each other practically between those two middle screens at 20 and 30 sieve. But the amazing part is the pan basically grows 
about 5% additional coffee into that pan with each one of those minor changes in that grinder. So again, what I would really like to have everybody feel for is that minor changes can make big results uh, when we're searching for that sweet spot in a grinder. So besides burr gap, one of the things I looked at was, okay, one of the most common things in the States, for some reason, they want to burn beans. Uh, I am a medium roast to a, to a light roast and experiment with dark roast drinker, but uh, roast color, and again, I don't understand all of roast color, but I've got a set of Agtron tiles that I use for my quick reference in the lab uh, to see roast color. But then I went to a, one of the, the roasters that we work with a lot and said, would you send me coffee with two different roast colors? So it's the same blend, uh, just uh, different roast colors. So they sent me a 30, basically a 31 plus or minus 3, it was their Agtron target, and a 52 plus or minus 3, which was their Agtron uh, color chart. And I labeled them as medium and dark, medium being the 50, 30 being the dark. And again, you can see that quick, now this is at the 8 setting, the finer setting, that it went from 03 to 0. These two stayed virtually the same, 19 to 16, 35 to 34, but about again, about a 5% change in the final pan, just by changing rose color from 50 to 30. Now, is that a big change? Uh, I think it's common in a lot of shops, if you have two different rose colors and one grinder, you don't necessarily change the grinder for the different rose color. Uh, I oftentimes tell people when we're setting up batch brewing equipment, and they have to, is set the grind that brews correctly for your dark roast, and then work with tools in the equipment, uh, pulse brew, bypass, pre-infusion, whatever it happens to be, with the light roast. Because if you set it up with the grind from the light and it grinds finer on the dark, you don't have a lot of ways to bring time back off of the finer grind distribution. Here's the nine. And again, you can see slight, these don't change a lot, but these two kind of continue to climb, and again, about a 5% on top of the total volume here on the nine, again, it changed just due to roast color. And the grind distribution with the 10, and again, it simply followed that things did get finer uh, all along, and again, about a 5% uh, additional weight falling into the pan just from roast color across this thing. This was with the same, same coffee. So I guess in, in the end is if you have one grinder and multi-coffees, you may end up with a setting for each one of those rose colors, maybe each type of coffee, but you'll also find there is a sweet spot in your grinder where you only use about 12 degrees of 360, <laughs> that there's such a small range of where you actually use that grinder. The things that are important in grind, the burrs being parallel, matching each other directly. If there's wobble in the motor, you got burrs doing this, you have larges falling out the side, you don't get that clean grind distribution. So it comes down to maintenance of your grinders is one of those things that's really important. When you take a set of burrs out, making sure that when you put everything back, it's all perfectly clean. Because if you got coffee packed up behind, you didn't see it in the corner, and you mounted your burr, and you tightened it up, and now the burr is pitched. When you bring burr wine in, you always have a gap. So it's important that as you maintain your grinders, uh, cleanliness is one of those things that when we put everything back together, everything lines up parallel. Because if it's off, you'll never get the grind distribution you were looking for. I think that's about where we're in. Randy? Thank All you. right, Randy. Okay, Francisca, take it away. Thank you. Okay, I'm glad to be here. 
Um, looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. I will uh, go over my research project with you. So um, I grew up in a house where my father brewed coffee on a siphon, so I always enjoyed good coffee um, for, uh, for my more than 10 years in the food industry. Coffee was just a passion to me and work in other fields, so it was uh, great when I could move into uh, to coffee. <clears throat> But um, yeah, it's, uh, in the introduction, it was said that I'm uh, sensory science, and that's true. My background is in sensory science, so uh, it's all about taste for me. And I will take you through it. So the difference, from my point of view, is the way we taste things. Um, in science, the way you taste things is a little different from the normal coffee cupping. I found out when I got a little deeper into the coffee world, because for tasting for me is having tasted blinded samples, so you don't know what you're actually tasting. You're more open-minded. You taste one thing at a time. <clears throat> you use references to describe it. And uh, very important for me is that uh, we use this uh, line scales. Yesterday, we tried the uh, Cup of Excellence scheme, and um, getting to know that was, uh, was a little strange for me because it has different scales. It has three, three point scale, eight point scale, and it has some uh, kind of quality um, issues in it. So um, I had to get used to it because I was always used to tasting this way. It's more objective, and um, using a line scale, you could actually have infinite. Uh, evaluations of whatever foodstuff that be, um, be in coffee, and the rating one attribute at a time. <clears throat> but um, I looked up on the internet when I started this project, everything I could about coffee, trying to find out what have actually been done scientifically on grinding coffee, not so much, I could say. Um, but uh, just looking up what was out there about knowing about coffee and tasting coffee, and of course I found out that you call it cupping. So when you Google cupping, you get a little shock, but uh, <laughs> there is coffee cupping. And of course that's what your guys are used to, um, the way of tasting coffee. But um, yeah, this way I will try to uh, explain to you is that we take each attribute at a time, whatever that might be in, in the coffee that we're um, evaluating. So tasting and smelling the coffee. Smell first because that's what you, you get first, and then afterwards tasting. So on a line scale here, you will be um, um, evaluating the coffee by a mark, saying, okay, is it from nothing to a lot? And uh, you will do that on each sample that you have, coded sample, blind, blinded, so you don't know the information behind it. And that way you could be more objective without knowing things. But that's describing coffee. So that's my background. I wanted to be a scientific and I want to prove things, so uh, I want to be able to repeat it and um, do it a lot of times before I can actually uh, make a conclusion. But um, yeah, the project started actually uh, last year at the Nordic Barista Cup. I did some small tests measuring uh, temperature in, uh, in grinding. And we uh, found out that there was a lot of debate going on on these uh, internet debate forums. A lot of uh, coffee geeks having opinions about grinders, blogs doing things, a lot of uh, coffee personality claiming uh, conical grinders being that way, flat grinders being that way. Okay, that's kind of interesting. So look, let's look into that. Um, does it actually have an effect? Can you taste the difference? So I set up my coffee lab in Copenhagen, gathered a bunch of grinders, and just started getting to know them, 
grinding away, brewing coffee, finding out, okay, so what's the difference between all these different grinders, some of them being conical, some of them being flat, and besides that, all other stuff. Uh, different types of uh, motors, different types of looks. So I basically just, this is just an example of one, so just, you know, I measure everything. So find out how static are they, what's going on with the coffee when you're actually grinding. And um, I weigh out coffee beans whenever I brew, before and after, um, for each grinder. And it surprised me actually that never is the same amount coming in as going out. Never. For I, I did more than a bunch of hundreds and hundreds of tests I think I had two or three where exactly the same amount going in was coming out. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more, and it goes for all the grinders. So, um, yeah, when you brew coffee, you have to, uh, you have to measure the, the grinding instead of the, the beans going in, if you want it to be precisely. That's, that's what I found. Okay, so could you actually taste the difference? So I set up... Uh, a consumer test, having, I did a triangle test, which you know, you have three cups of coffee. So I took, the only difference was the grinder. So same amount of coffee, same amount of water, um, same TDS. So the only difference being the grinder, flat or conical. So I had them set up, individual, random, all coded, randomly served, no information about what's going on here, just can you taste the difference, pin, uh, pin out the odd sample. So these uh, 50 consumers could not taste the difference between a flat and a conical grinder. Okay, well I know what you're thinking, it's consumers. They drink shitty coffee, right? <coughs> and lots of it, they don't know it, I know. So I thought, let's do the same test, but this time with a different crowd. Let's use the coffee people. That's you guys. So I set up in Nice in June, a small booth, the same triangle test, all coded, all randomized, so no one would get the same test. Uh, standing uh, next to each other, it was not the same test, and I was informed that. No information whatsoever what's going on here. But again, it was the same amount of coffee, the same amount of water, the same TDS, only difference being the grinder, flat or conical. Okay. So I was a bit excited about this because I had 164 coffee professionals coming by my booth tasting these coffees. And uh, all sorts of people. And I thought, okay, this is a great opportunity. I want to take a little background information on these people. So I asked them how they prefer the coffee, just to, to see. And... Um, yeah, well, luckily, um, a lot of them actually enjoy filter coffee, which I was serving, so it's not like it's unknown. And I ask a lot of questions about how they take the coffee, and also you could take if you use milk and sugar, and people were writing, no. It's, it's a no-go in coffee. I mean, if you don't have a restaurant. Okay. <laughs> okay. So... Um, so I was trying to see, okay, the coffee consumption here, uh, how much are these people actually drinking? And it's about two to nine cups a day if you're in the coffee business, which is all right. But it um, doesn't seem that the more coffee you drink, the better you get at tasting the difference between flat and conical. There's no correlation here. Okay. Well, so I asked them, how long have you been in the business? And it's not newcomers that went bye by this test. Um, some of them have been in the business more than 15 years. But again, it doesn't seem there's correlation between how many years in the business and how much you're able to taste the difference, actually. Okay. So I had 164 coffee professionals tasting these coffees. But they could not taste the difference between flat and conical burrs. Okay, so whatever was out there, 
on the internet, claims and uh, things. I could not prove it because you guys could not taste the difference. But it's hard. There were very small differences when you knew it. This was, of course, as I told you, it was blinded, coded, no information. So uh, all of you that went by didn't know what was going on. So actually now it's revealed. But um, that's uh, when I tasted it, you know, you could find, okay, might be a little more here or there. So um, I went back to uh, my actually uh, main, main thing is like the sensory science. Let's describe the coffees and then see if there was a difference. Okay, so I set up a tasting panel of uh, coffee professionals from Denmark. And these people were people who are roasters, cup, um, baristas, some are trainers, some have been in the Cup of Excellence. They're not necessarily cupping every day, but they know about coffee and they know tasting coffee have opinions about coffee. So I was a little um, eager to see, okay, can I teach old dogs new tricks? Because I know how you taste coffee, you cup it, and you, maybe you know something, and you talk about a lot about coffee. So I wanted to have this, um, the line scale, teaching them the line scale, okay? So you can actually go from nothing to a lot. So what I did, I did uh, tr some training sessions from the variety of coffee coming from different grinders, saying, okay, what kind of uh, profile are we talking about here? So <clears throat> I had five grinders, I had my six judges, I set up in the, in the tasting lab, and the judges were ch um, choosing the attributes. That means that they have to agree upon it. So it doesn't matter if one can say, okay, one coffee of these uh, five coffees has blueberry in it. It doesn't matter if all of the rest of the panel can't taste it. It wouldn't matter um, statistically. So these are the um, attributes that they could agree upon. So they have some taste, some smell, and mouthfeel. And you see the code down here? Uh, that's what is used in the... Um, statistics afterwards. And that's, um, that's actually how we do it all the time because we use multivit statistic in uh, sensory science. And some of you might know all there is about to know about uh, multivit statistics. Some of you are getting a little scared now. Don't be. Um, I always think of it as a map because it's so genius that you could actually pull together a lot of information at the same time. You don't have to look at one variable at a time. You could look at all different, how are things connected. So it's like over here, it might, might be a little floral, or over here might be some acidic, and over here in this part of the world might be a little lighter or whatever. It's kind of, things are connected this way. So don't worry about all the numbers and stuff like that. This is the uh, results from the sensory coffee professional panel. Okay, so you had the attributes. These are the red things over here. So these are the, the description of the coffees. So over here, you can see it's kind of a, a little lump together. Why is that? Well, because this model here is actually explained more of the panel members being here, panel members here. So if you're over here, you're using the faraway part of the scale. Okay, so this is high in chocolate smell, this is high in acidity, and if you're over here, you're kind of using, well, not so much, not so much, not so much, on every coffee. Um, so actually, they were given a more variety, more explainance of the model than the actually grinders themselves. Why is that? Well, I think it's because that 
these coffee professionals are individuals. They know so much about coffee, and some of them think it's a competition. You sit in there, you want to guess, okay, what kind of... They tried to guess what kind of coffee it was, what was going on, and of course, they didn't know anything about it. I didn't tell them because I want them to be objective. So, a little hard to draw anything from this. Is it all bad then? <clears throat> no, luckily not. <clears throat> Because there is tendency, actually. As you can see here, it seems that the conical grinders are actually lined up in this area, being able to produce a more sweet coffee coming from these grinders than the flat grinders in, in this area, having a tendency to be producing coffee more acidic. So these are tendencies. Um, but it was kind of interesting. So I think, okay, so what can I do? So I went back to my old hood, sensory science lab in uh, university. There is a professional tasting booth here. So I set up another panel, consisting of uh, research staff and master students on, uh, on the food science department. So what they have is that they have a prior knowledge of tasting this way, using this scale on other foodstuffs. Um, being used to sit in here evaluating this way, kind of objective. And uh, they all drank coffee as well. So again, I set up brewing coffee. I had six judges, I had six grinders, half conical, half flat. So let's describe the coffees coming from this. So again, I trained this panel so they this is their words describing the coffees coming from these grinders. So, of course, it's the same coffee. Great coffee from uh, Solberg and Hansen. But uh, they used a little different words because they found something else. Or they use other words to describe it. Doesn't really matter. It's um, whatever they could uh, agree upon. So, instead of the uh, coffee professional, for example, having used the word or agreeing upon the word citrus on describing a flavor. Here, they were more specific. We talked about it. What kind of, we started out citrus. Was it citrus then in the, in the training? Was, was it lemon? Was it orange? Was it something in between or whatever? And they said, on, okay, so it's lemon. But that's, that's how you do it. And I did uh, a bunch of statistics and uh, it showed out that actually the more significant um, descriptors were bitter and sour to distinguish between conical and flat burst. That was the most significant uh, attributes. So again here, here's the map. So here are some grinders. The red one are grinders. And the black words here are description of the coffee. That means that up here, the Faima grinder has higher intensity in smell of chocolate than compared to the Vario, who is, um, has a more acidic taste and more um, high intensity in the smell of lemon. And over here, you have the Malkunic K30 with these uh, tobacco-like notes that is enhanced from this grinder. And uh, the Matsurober and the Simonella Mutus over here having more sweetness and hazelnut. So you can have all. This is just what is more pronounced. And being in the middle here, it's like you have a little of it all, but it's not like something is that important uh, or, or pronounced. So this is the map, the tasting map of the grinders in the sensory world. Okay, so Randy talked about the grinding distribution. And I was so fortunate that the Nova Simulani lab did some grinding uh, particle size distribution for me as well. So they had coded samples sent to them coming from these grinders. So it's the same. I had settings producing coffee with the same TDS. So the same TDS coffee 
from different grinders. So if you remember this picture here, instead of the, the grinder name here, let's put the particle distribution. It looks like this. So the, it's the black box here for the, for the flat grinders and the green box for the conical grinders. So I looked very deeply into this to see, okay, is it like conical grinders is like this and flat grinders is like that? No, it's not. But you can see, okay, this pattern over here will give you more bitterness and more tobacco notes or whether if you have like this, you're in the sweet and uh, also hazelnut and here as chocolate and caramel. So to me, it wasn't obvious that, that the particle distribution is just correlated to whatever taste. And it's not like you can look at the particle distribution and know which taste. It's not that simple. So I did uh, try to put it on in, in one time, in, uh, just at one time looking at it to see, okay, does it make any sense? Can I actually divide grinders by looking at the bird type? Uh, no, we cannot. It's much more complex. But I did a model which distinguished between the two types. So having the conical grinders here at the red spot and the blue grinders up there. So this statistically model actually distinguished between these two. So let's put these two pictures together and see what happens. It's when you want to see, okay, so what difference is if, if you're uh, dividing them into the type of burrs? And you can see here that the flat grinders, they seem to have an uh, increased uh, taste of chocolate and licorice compared to the flat, uh, to the conical grinders. And that's for this coffee. It would be different with another coffee. This is the Ethiopian Tade from uh, Solberg and Hansen. And you can see actually that the conical grinder, they enhances the smell. So when you get the coffee, this proves that the smell from these grinders and this coffee determined by this panel, then actually you have a higher intensity in smell, whereas the flat uh, grinders will give you a higher intensity in, the, in some of the taste notes. So just to wrap it up, um, there was a lot of saying about whether there was a taste difference between a flat and a conical burst. And well, yeah. There is, but it's so small, it's so hard to find. And if you just taste it blind, knowing nothing, you m might not find it. So it's much more than just flat or conical burrs, it's individual grinders, because it's, it's not just the burrs. It's like, okay, so how long does it take to go from the burrs and out? What is, is there a funnel? How is the transportation of ground? and? Some have a lot of retention having ground coffee stay in the grinder and some just distribute all of it out. Um, so, well, we started up, we had to, to look into something. Um, a whole lot of more questions arise and um, there's so many things to look into. Okay, do the same test, but with a different coffee having other sensory attributes. Um, trying different brew methods, so I, I used filtered coffee. Um, it could be fun to do the same with espresso. See what's going on there, will you then be able to see a, a more pronounced difference? Um, what's, what's the motor, what does it actually have um, an, uh, an effect? So is it all bad? No, I'm excited, we need more research and uh, let's just, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's great. I think uh, um, 
my dream is to do a PhD in coffee because it's just there's so many interesting things and uh, so much we don't know yet. But uh, I hope that some of you guys are just eager to find out, to learn more about coffee and what's actually affecting the taste because what it comes down to is taste to me. So I had the privilege of working with a lot of coffee gurus who helped me along the way and really appreciate it. They're introducing me into the specialty coffee world. Um, I like it here, I don't want to leave. Um, and uh, thank you to all the research partners that uh, sponsored the project and uh, helped along the way. Without them, it was not um, possible. So I think that uh, in a couple of minutes, we're going to taste ourselves. So thank you. Thank you very much. Super interesting. Super interesting. So, what we're going to do is just stay in our seats for a, a minute or two. Maybe we should ask a question or two now before. Is well, that okay? Yeah, it's, it's okay, but maybe I should explain a little what to do at the that's, table. That's perfect. Do that. Okay. Because there is uh, a bunch of uh, coffees over there. And you will get, for my test, there is three cups you have to evaluate. Just taste them from left to right, quickly. And there's some small notes there. And mark the one you think is different in sourness from the two others. Just what you think is different. And there's a small note, you just uh, mark it there. And then next to it, there are three other cups. And again, taste it from left to right. Which one is different in bitterness? Just mark the one you think is different from the two others. Um, and then there is three more coffees, which, uh, which Randy has. And we will talk about them when you get there. But it's just important that you mark them on the small spot. Just do it quickly. Don't think too much about it. And then I like to have these small notes back. So just if the captain of the table could collect them or something. And then I could show the, the uh, results afterwards. And you have a small booklet where you also have, uh, and you can mark them. I think it's upside down that the bitter is before the sour, but you're clever, so you figure it out. Um, so just mark these, put them down, don't change it. And, and what they're marking is it's a triangle, right? They're saying yeah. which one is different. Yes. And there's a, there's a set, and it says sour, and a set that says bitter. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's uh, a triangle of... Which one's different from the others mm. on each of and those two? And then they're uh, next to each other. Three cups is sour, which also is written on the table, and three cups is bitter. Yep. And there will be three cups more for Randy's. So you will have to taste nine great cups of coffee. Okay. Right. The, the three other cups uh, on the end, which will be in uh, slots 10, 11, and 12, and they're coded F9 or F10, F9, and F8. Uh, in those particular slots, and it's simply a preference test of which of the three cups do you prefer most. And it's really quite simple, it's kind of what we did before. One's a conical, one's a flat, and one is just the 20 sieve grind sample out of a, out of a set of sieve analysis. So it's more monomodal, if you will, of a section of the coffee where they're all more in similar size. So of those three cups, it's simply a, a simple preference test if you record which one uh, you prefer. We're a few minutes away from actually doing this because I, wanna, I want people to not get in the way of the uh, attendees, sorry, of the volunteers delivering the coffee right now. So let's just give it one more minute. Klaus, just a sec. That was dramatic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just um, a couple of quick questions that maybe you can clarify. Um, one is how did you choose the um, representatives of the conical and the flat burr grinders? I Sorry, I can't hear you. Can, you. can you repeat it? How did you choose the uh, representative grinders for uh, the flat and conical grinders? I didn't kind of, it was not like I went out picking, but I said, okay, I'm open for anything, and that's just so, they kind of uh, uh, 
broad variety of what's around and what is being used. I did a test in Copenhagen, went into all coffee bars and wrote down what are they using. So they're in the test, but they kind of use two different grinders in Copenhagen. So uh, I put a, a lot of grinders in as well. So what was available, and then it was like, okay, some have small birds, some have uh, bigger birds. So it's, I think it was uh, a great variety. But, you know, there's a thousand of grinders out there, so you could, you could use more. So. Uh, are you thinking of looking into the uh, EK43 grinder as maybe a next thing? Yeah, that could be fun. I mean, yeah, that's, that's just the, the grinder of the week, I guess, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Flavor of the month. So I think that um, what, what uh, people have been doing that grinder, maybe you can do with a lot of other grinders too. Just explore it and try to figure out new ways to use it because it's, well, it's been there all along since the 70s, I think. So just look at it upon new, yeah, new eyes and just whatever is available. And I think you're, if you play around with it, maybe you'll be able to have uh, great coffee from most grinders. Can I ask one more question? What was the water specs that you used? The water specs? It was a, some sort of... A, it was a filter in the restaurant. And I have the specifics if you want it. I can't remember what the name is. But it was filtered water. Did you use the same water across the uh, test that you did for of private course. and... Yeah, yeah. of course. Okay, yeah. So everything okay. is the same. Yeah. I have a question here in the mid-center. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, did you, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very interesting to see that first, but um, did you ever make, uh, maybe uh, tell the people that there are three sets and one is different, or, no, uh, what I mean is, uh, did you tell them this is uh, uh, from a flat grinder and this is from a conical, so no. that maybe they have, would you maybe con consider no. doing this? So maybe there's, some people think, well, a conical grinder is better, so I prefer this. Although yeah, but, no but when I did that test, I was not interested in uh, preference because uh, I wanted to be, wait, can you actually taste the difference? Because what is preference? It's just, it's just whatever you feel like, whatever you grew up with, whatever you ever tried. So preference is individual and preference can be uh, taught and preference can be uh, changed. But... Uh, yeah, if you can't taste the difference, then how can you prefer one over the other? Uh, well, but uh, what I mean is that maybe there some people, uh, it's just a psychological effect that if you tell them something and mm -hmm. it's all the same, they will still recognize the difference. It's, it's just a, a, psycho a psychological precondition. Just like in hi-fi cables, for example, when you make a blind test, everyone says it's all the same. But when you tell them, well, this is a 2,000 euro cable, it tastes completely different and mm -hmm. it's way better. Maybe yeah. something like this. But, the, but that's not, that's not the tasting objective. That's testing like what this brand value has uh, to do with it. And then, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not a taste test. It's a psychological test. Yeah. But that's, of course, that's, what, that's why you don't tell anything. It's because you want to keep out all this knowledge and preference. And that's, I think, was what was hard for the uh, sensory panel consistent of coffee professionals. Because uh, some of them thinking, okay, what, what is this? What is this? And... They want to, because they know, have a lot of knowledge, and they want to use it. So, so taking that away from it, and then can, you can actually, what you do is, normally you do a pref mapping, is that in multivet statistics, you can do a preference test, and then just combine it with this, instead of saying, okay, would you like to have cherry notes or strawberry notes in your coffee? Then just do a profile test, and then do a preference test with some other people, and you can combine it and find out, okay, which do people actually like? Mm. I had a question for Andy, I guess. Uh, did you find a correlation between the size of the burrs and the particle size distribution? I mean, if I buy a bigger grinder, do I get less fines and better extraction? You're asking me? That, that was for you, yeah. <laughs> OK, the, the grinders I tested were all uh, three inch uh, diameter and smaller, uh, the con conical naturally being a little more narrow. Uh, I never got into this, the six inch, you know, larger burrs. Uh, as time expands, we'll certainly head down that direction uh, because speed of how quickly you break it into smaller pieces and pass it through, 
the less heat you generate and the less tumbling and breakage you would likely see. So it will be a, a, a good idea to see that if it's spread out and how it's fed into a broader uh, ring of, of where it actually gets cut up, that it doesn't have as much time bouncing inside, breaking up, that it, it may possibly reduce the fines. So that'll be something interesting to actually compare to. I have a question back here. Hello. Uh, you say that you want to put the evaluation of the coffees more towards actually measuring the amount of sweetness, the amount of acidity, the amount of chocolates, and so forth. So you're measuring intensity more than actually evaluating the quality of the different brews. But don't you think that that makes it a little less interesting for seeing whether or not it's better with a conical grinder or a flat bar grinder? I realize that uh, where you want to go with this research were to see if there's actually a difference, but um, I still think that the results would have been more interesting if we were seeing mm. at least coffee professionals evaluating the differences. Yeah. Are well, you saying that you you can't objectively measure quality because I think it's the wrong crowd? If that's what you're saying. No, no. I, I'm just saying if you talk about quality. So, so what is co define quality? Because this was the same coffee, it, so it was different taste. Um, but of course, you could do like. Uh, I think when you're talking quality like that, then it must be like preference quality, maybe. Or um, are you the, saying that there is no objectively better coffee than worse coffee? Well, if you do an extraction at 24% and an extraction at 20%, if you ask 200 people in this room, I think all of them will prefer the 20%. Well, let's do that test. I don't know. Um, that would be interesting. Well, well you could argue I, that I don't think balance, everyone prefers instance. the same. That's what I'm saying. But balance, but of, sweetness. Yeah, but you don't the, think everyone prefers balance and sweetness. Not the same balance and sweetness. No, I don't. But I think that uh, well, yeah. Of course, you can brew it differently. Yeah, you could do that, and it would be interesting to do, maybe have different, like uh, the same grinder, and then have different settings, brew in the coffee, different TDS, and then do a test. That would be very interesting, I think. So, of course, quality has to do with it and, uh, and preference. But if, if you don't like the coffee, then why drink it? But it's just uh, a way of describing it. It has to be objective in, in my point of view. Okay, we're going to hold further questions. We need to get up and get to our cupping tables. So, do that now. Cosmo, raise your hand again, please. There you go. Here we go. Thank you, Jay. So it's not a question that I made. Actually, is over Twitter, David Walsh is asking, what is the statistical power of the study? Is it significant? Sample sizes, etc. cetera. Particle, uh, P lower than 0 0.05. So I'm just reading his question. Yeah. Well, thank you for that question, David Walsh. Yes, of course it's significant. It's more power, actually, than that. It's 0 0.001. So, yeah, it's significant, yeah. But the first thing, that was just tendency with the first panel, but, uh, yeah, it is. Okay. For those of us who don't understand statistics? Yeah, well. It, it means it, the, the, the it results means were meaningful. It's, uh, it's true. That's okay. just what it means. <laughs> <laughs> I love when scientists say that. <laughs> it's true. Good. Um, should, should we have our show of hands on, I think preference is going to be a hard word here. Uh, <laughs> but, um, preference is the perfect word. But it is but the perfect word. that's what, what it is. Yeah, it, it I'm is. I'm going to taste it as well. Yeah. Um, so the numbers were, who liked cup 12, F8 best? Okay. Who liked F9 best? Who liked F10 best? Okay, so it goes like this. Spot 12, the one at the end of the table, is F8. So let's do it again. Who liked F8, the end of the table best? Who liked F9, the middle of the three cups best? And who liked F10, the one in the middle of the table? Okay. So, sorry, did I say middle? I meant the left. Hello. 
God. That's what I meant. Okay, sorry. Is that 0.02? Okay, so basically, the vast majority of people liked F8. F8 12? Yeah. Does anybody want to know what it is? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you actually do. That's actually the 20 sieve. Okay. That is the, uh, the middle road, uh, basically, uh, the 20 sieve off of a set is above 850 micron, below uh, 1180, uh, as far as a sieve set. So that's kind of the middle of the grind range in a typical flat versus conical. The other two were simply a, a distribution off of a flat burr and a very, very similar distribution off a of conical burr. They were all the same coffee. Uh, and so the, the 20 sieve seems to, uh, to be it, so. Very I have interesting. a question in the back here. What's that? Is that what I was expecting? Uh, I wasn't really expecting a result at all. Uh, in my pretest, I tried to set up a parameter of brewing that had them all within a few points of soluble. Uh, they ranged from about 1.25 to about 1.32, uh, depending on how many tests I did. So they were in a relatively tight range uh, of about 18 and a half up to about 20% extraction uh, for all three samples. Uh, in the pre-brews, we didn't test them back here simply for expedience to get them out here, but in the pre-test they were all sampled, so they were all at least somewhere in a significant tight range of uh, soluble. But uh, I had no pre preconceived notion of what it should come out as. Randy, you have a question in the back corner here. I'm very interested to know, what coffee was it? Uh, that was a Sulawesi. Uh, that uh, if I, I probably pronounced it wrong, a Taraja, mm -hmm. T-R-A-G-A, I believe, mm -hmm. A-J-A, mm -hmm. that uh, just was just a unique coffee that I could get one from one of our local roasters. It just wasn't your, your standard run-of-the-mill coffee, so. Mm -hmm. And back here in the mid-center. Uh, did, you, did you ever taste it with, uh, I don't know, with a, yeah. with a good coffee? <laughs> uh, did you ever taste it with a, with, a, with a good coffee? I mean, with a, with a light roast? Uh... Let's, this is not, a, not an important question, actually. Let, let's, uh, because basically what we're doing is we're tasting, we're tasting for grind size here. And just because it's not our preference to have a darker roast, I mean, that's, that's not uh, the point. That, that coffee is actually incredibly good coffee. Uh, clean washed coffee from Sulawesi. Uh, it's just a darker roast. But... Uh, so we're uh, just... But, but, but I mean, maybe with a lighter roast? I mean, it was hard to pick. Yeah, that's all right. It's okay. Yeah. It's, it's Other questions? Gabe? Yeah. Sorry, here, I'll come to you, but I will not fall down. Uh, this more has to do with the other grinder you were talking about earlier, that, like in industrial settings, the two rolling pins. Mm -hmm. um, what's to keep us from basically developing something like that for normal consumption, or if it's, because you said it's much more accurate than a normal like conical set. I'm not sure I understand that question. Well, there's, I haven't seen that applied in like a setting that could be used in a cafe. Uh, is there, have you guys looked into that technology on a smaller scale, perhaps? There's, there's the other brinder set, is like two, the two rolling pins. The, the rollers, <clears throat> oftentimes with the rollers, I think, whether you're grinding coffee or whether you're grinding other substances as the particle fineness that they can actually achieve, uh, wet milling or wet grinding would probably be the most preferable to get everything to a similar grind size, but that doesn't work with coffee because we don't want it wet till we brew it. Uh, so in, in dry grinding, uh, they actually have what may be referred to as a homogenizer that kind of blends the grind back together as it comes through the different rollers. There may not only be a pre-breaking set to break the bean down in size, then the distribution set, but yet another part of it kicks over and goes through a finer set yet. So they can achieve specific numbers if you either did a row tap or wanted to hit more, more of your curve in a certain spot. 
typically with just two flat burrs or one set of conical burrs, you simply don't have that, that distribution chance. You're always going to get a range of smalls and, and fines and larger pieces. But my assumption is that a, a roller like that, uh, it's a, a, an industrial piece of equipment. It's yes. not something that you could sort of scale down to a home or, a, or even a professional like coffee bar right uh, I, I don't think you'll ever see that in that small of a scale I, n never is a harsh word but someday somebody may come up with a smaller one that's did you just mention a precise grinder that would act with uh, water there are some milling processes not necessarily for coffee but for some milling processes they actually wet mill they add moisture what about wetting with uh, 92 degrees water Like David Walsh was uh, trying it. Grind while you're brewing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say it's probably a unique concept that would someday work, but uh, it, it, it'd be cleanup that would be, you know, how do you Ooh. discharge and have a clean brewing system each time uh, would be the, the logistical error of it of saying, now how do I get back to a clean surface uh, so I have a clean cup each time? Mm. Other questions? I'm on my way. Oh, talk. you got it. All right. I have one question for Frasetska. Um, uh, when you used and, and tried to do this unless, um, did you use the same roast, the same batch from, from a roast, or was it uh, several roasts that you use in your analysis? Um, for each test, it was the same roast, but this um, research has gone on for several months. Of course, the... Uh, the batch that I, I took for the consumer's test is not the same batch I, as I took in June, but it's, uh, yeah, well, Sober Hansen quality, like how, how well do they roast it each time, but it was the same batch for like a, di a whole different um, each test. So, for the panel, huh? Yeah, so it's the same coffee and pretty much the same roast every time, being those differences that will be every time of, of a batch, yeah. That would be actually a very interesting thing to track the to track the actual roast profile and sort of degree of roast for the test because you know as we all know mm. th there are slight variations. Yeah, mm. but but within the test, it was the same batch. Of course. So there was no differences at all. Other questions? Here you go in the center. Um, you said that there was not really a difference between the flat and the conical um, grinders. Did you find something else like, okay, this is a difference we, we, we saw, like this is small size of, of burrs or big size of burrs or something else. Did you find something else that you could see like, okay, this is significant? Well, what, what I said was that it's really, it's kind of individuals grinders. Grinders are like individuals because you cannot just talk about the size of the burr or the type of the burr. It has to do with how the grinder is built and the size of the motor and uh, actually the, uh, the way that its coffee is being pushed through and also retention, uh, how much is staying in, how much is regrind. So no, unfortunately not. From though, all those variables that I looked upon, it was not, you cannot say that, okay, do you have a grinder at home? <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> She's not going to tell you. <laughs> okay. What I think we should do is give ourselves a five-minute a five-minute break. Um, let's thank these guys so much. Thank you.